Everyone and welcome. Today we're here to talk about photography from panoramics to macro and you're going to get an introduction of the world of NovaFlex. My name is Joe Brady and along with some special guests who I'll introduce in just a minute, we're here today to take a look at two very different and perhaps maybe opposite photographic pursuits, panoramic and macro photography. So to help us with this exploration, I'm going to have the pleasure to introduce you to NovaFlex, a company that many of you may not yet be familiar with. And I do say yet because once you get to know them, and even better, once you get to use some of this gear, you're going to become a great fan of the equipment they make. Now before we take a look at today's photography subjects, I'd like to introduce you to some special guests, some of who have traveled all the way from Germany to be with us today. First of all, sitting right next to me, Martin Grahl, the sales manager of NovaFlex. Hello. Michael Hiesinger, the NovaFlex co-CEO. The other CEO guy is hiding over behind the camera. He didn't want to come out here, but he's here also if you want to ask him a question. And Kim Marie Song, the product manager, the sales manager US for NovaFlex. Welcome to everybody. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for Thanks coming. For Always us. Uh, Thank you. great distance to be with us. Now, I've known about NovaFlex as a company for some time, but it's just recently that I've had the opportunity to actually put some of this equipment to use out in the field. Before we get started, can you give us a little bit of an overview about NovaFlex? Well, certainly. Um, NovaFlex got founded back in 1948 uh, in a small Bavarian town called Memmingen, which is uh, one hour west of Munich. And very quickly it became well known in the uh, macro photography business. Um, we developed a lot of different bellows and focusing rails, not only under the NovaFlex brand, but also um, as OEM products for um, other well-known companies, which include Hasselblad, Alpa, and many others. Yeah. Um, the other um, interesting and well-known NovaFlex product, you may have seen one, is uh, perhaps um, the NovaFlex Follow Focus lens. And what was uh, pretty unique about this lens was that when you focused it, it you did not um, turn two different lens barrels against each other, but uh, it got focused by pushing um, a hand grip underneath um, and be it became very famous with uh, wildlife and sports yeah, photographers. Yeah, so this was not a little lens. <laughs> yeah, it was a bazooka-like <laughs> lens. lens. Um, later on, um, we developed uh, some flashlights for macro photography and um, back in 1996, um, Mr. Hiesinger, Michael's father, took over the company. <laughs> he's, he's hiding there behind the camera. Together with Mr. Klaus Bote, he took over the company and most of the products we are, um, which are featured today um, got developed. Um, we uh, um, developed the NovaFlex Magic Ball. Mr. Hiesinger and Klaus Bote did this together. Um, we will be talking about the Magic oh, Ball yes. at, during the show. And we also do, um, became known um, for doing some uh, panorama photography stuff which, and which we're going to see of course uh, some new bellows uh, came to life Michael I understand also NovaFlex is well known for their adapter plates yes to take one lens to another that, yeah. that's, is that something that's growing uh, currently yet yeah, it's definitely a, a growing part of the of the company um, here over in the US market we became famous for for making the best lens adapters and um, Yes, we are still going on with this development of new adapters, new types. For those of you who have gone mirrorless, as I have with my Sony cameras that you see here on the set, uh, it's become very popular to get older lenses or lenses, maybe you're switching from one manufacturer to another, to be able to adapt your lenses to these new mirrorless cameras. And they're a very useful kind of piece. You can just put the adapter on and use your, for example, your old Canon lens on a, on a Sony. Yeah, exactly. Or a Leica or whatever you happen to have around. Now, I just spent the past two and a half weeks teaching photography workshops out west. And the tripod head, which I'll show you a little bit later, is called the Magic Ball. It became an object of desire mm -hmm. for everybody that was on this trip. I have never seen a tripod head like this before. Once you use one, you will want one. It was dangerous for me to play with because now <laughs> I, have, I have to have it. And some of your designs are somewhat unique. I hadn't seen this. Actually, I'm going to go get it while, while we're discussing this. How did you come up with this idea? I'm going to grab the head. My father, Reinhard, and the co-founder, Klaus Bode, came up with the idea back in 1998. 
Um, the goal was to create something not only different, but um, something that makes uh, makes pleasure to use uh, while, for while doing your shots. And that's something very unique. We came up with an upside down ball head concept. So they redesigned the whole ball, classic ball head setup. And I, that's what it looks yeah, like. I had never seen anything like this. And I've used a lot of tripod heads over the years. Without a doubt, this is my favorite tripod head I have ever used. This is it right here. It's got a single knob here and it's got what, 120 degrees in any direction anywhere you want, and as soon as you tighten this up, it won't move. You could have a really big lens on this, it doesn't move. I put my entire body weight on the thing <laughs> and I couldn't get the head to move. Uh, it's really the, simply the most, it's the easiest, it's the most stable, it's the best machine, it's the best tripod head I've ever used. So they didn't pay me to say that. Uh, <laughs> it was just my experience of using this out west, actually out in the field. Now I'd like to get started with our two topics. So we're going to start with an overview first of panoramic photography. Now I got to put the VR Panorama 3 system to use, which is standing right here. And this is another piece of gear that once I started using, I don't want to live without this. Uh, I recorded some video during my last trip to capture some great panoramic images. So we're going to head out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming and Grand Teton National Park to see the system in action. We'll all be in the chat room to answer your questions and talk about them when we come back. But let's first go out to Grand Teton. I'm really fortunate to have spent the last week in Grand Teton National Park. And this is just a place that screams for panoramics. So to do that, I've got a great rig with me. Now it's true that a lot of cameras have automatic panoramic functions now, including even your iPhone. But to make a really interesting panorama, it really helps to have objects in the foreground. It gives you something to lead to, lead you into the image off to that distant scene. However, if you're rotating around in a curve like this, what ends up happening is when you go to stitch, those foreground elements have a tendency to break apart. They don't stitch well. And what we want to do is get consistent, precise results every time. We can do one and be done. Now to make that happen, I've got a remarkable rig here. Uh, from NovaFlex. Let's go over a couple of the parts. At the bottom here I have a Magic Ball uh, tripod head and one of the amazing things about this is it just rotates any way you want. Just tighten up the knob on the back and it stays in place. Even with a heavy lens. This is a remarkable piece. Uh, it's the most favorite tripod head I've ever used. I have to have one of these. So after the Magic Ball, the next piece on top of this is a Panorama QR48 plate. Now this is a remarkable piece. I had never used one of these before but this week and I've absolutely fallen in love with it. In fact, let me rotate the whole system around so you can see it a little better. Let's get that right there. Now part of the name is from these detentes that are in this system. It goes from 0 to 16 to 30 to 36 to 48. And what that means is, if you're going to rotate around, how many steps do you want? So if I go 16, it clicks into 16 different rotations around the system. Really makes it beautiful, makes it repeatable. If you want to be really fine, you can go all the way up to 48, and then each of your movements is much smaller. Really makes getting panoramas very quick and easy. I found that for most of my lenses, 16 to 35, and 24 to 70, that either the 16 steps or the 30 steps gives me just the perfect amount of overlap for each image when I go to restitch that. Very cool piece, you're going to want one of these. Now on top of that, I have a VR panel rig. This is the Model 2, and I've got my camera mounted horizontally. I'm going to shoot vertically, but I first want to show you something about the nodal point. And what the nodal point is, is it's the optical center of the camera. It's the point where the light beams cross. And when you line up a camera or rotate a camera so that the nodal point is right over the center of the rotating tripod head, as you turn left to right, your foreground elements and your distant elements line up perfectly. It makes for great stitches. Now, how do you find the nodal point? So let's go take a look at that first. I happen to have a couple of trees over here that are perfectly vertical. I'm going to line them up with some distant elements and watch and see what happens as we find the nodal point. And by the way, to do that, we'll be pushing the camera forward and back to find that nodal point. And then we can use this fine screw here 
to just fine tune it so we get an exactly perfect spot. Once we find the nodal point, we can record the numbers that are on this system so that when we have a certain focal length, we can always get exactly back to the right spot. No wasting time, just get there. I happen to know that on my uh, 24 to 70, that if I put this rail here on number six with my camera right in the center and this plate all the way back, that's perfect for 24 millimeters. So it lets me to go from place to place, line it up, start shooting, and it's great. And you're gonna see some great samples. So let's take a look and see how you set the nodal point. So to set up my nodal point on a panoramic rig, I'm gonna take advantage of this tree right here. It's perfectly straight and it gives me a reference in the foreground to the background. Now, if you look behind, there's a boulder in the middle of the lake there, and I've got the tree lined up just with the left edge of the boulder. What's gonna happen is as the camera rotates, normally you're gonna see this move to the, distance, uh, the distant objects. Same thing if you put your finger out in front and you close your eyes. One at a time, you'll see your finger jump left and right. Same thing happens with your camera if it's not rotating on the nodal point. So I move the camera a little closer to the shore. I've got my tree here. I've got my boulder off in the lake. Let's take a look first as we rotate the camera mounted over the center of the ball head. This is what would happen if you didn't have a VR rig and you just mounted it on that ball head. So let's watch as the tree moves in relationship to the distant boulder. Then I'll move the camera back in the rig so that we can find the nodal point and then watch how this tree stays lined up with that boulder no matter which way we turned. That's what allows you to get a perfect stitch every time. So here we have the camera set in the middle of the tripod head just as if it was a standard ball head and watch what happens as the tree moves in relationship to the boulder in the lake. This is because the camera is rotating right over the center of the ball head as if we did not have a panel rig. Now let's move back to our nodal point and see what happens as we rotate. So now I've moved the rig back to the nodal point. Now watch what happens as we rotate left. Notice the relationship of the tree to the boulder stays the same, the exception of some parallax in the lens. And you can see now as we rotate, everything stays lined up. So now that we've found the nodal point, I do want to shoot this as a vertical and have everything stitched together. So what I'm going to do is just flip the camera on its mount to a vertical. So now I'm all ready to shoot my panorama. You can see I've got the camera mounted vertically now. I've found my nodal point for the system. You can see it's pretty far back. The camera body's way back here. This is what allows me to line up these foreground elements with the distance. Also, by having these little click stops in the head, since it's really windy, the clouds are moving pretty quickly. This will allow me to move quickly so that the amount of work that the software stitching has to do to make those clouds line up will be at a minimum. So let's just take a look here. And the beauty is I don't even have to look through the system. I can just start shooting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's do one more, nine. And that's it. That's how easy it is to get a really complex panorama with foreground elements and distant elements. I'll take you through the software so you can see it. And I want to show you some great examples that I've been able to get this week both at a couple of days I was in Telluride before I came here, and then some great panoramics in Grand Teton. All made possible because of this rig. I love it. I want one. You're going to want one too.
So I guess you can gather from what you just saw, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, this, this definitely. Is, this is a fun piece of gear. Uh, something about this plate, and I did mention it, uh, the Q48 plate that I have underneath the, eat this thing, there are these little numbers on the side, and at first I had no idea what they were. <laughs> I actually had to read the manual, because uh, I saw 16, 30, 36, 36 and, 48. and 48. What does that mean? It's actually how many clicks there are in 360 degrees. So I found that with my 24 millimeter lens, that 16 was actually perfect amount of overlap, so that I didn't even have to look through the camera. Once I set it up, it just clicked into place, yep. and that's how I got my perfect stitches. Uh, now, I know that was just a taste of the capabilities the system has, but in the meantime, we invite you to visit NovaFlex.com. In fact, again, here's the, uh, the address. Uh, so do take a look at it. Gentlemen, what else can you tell me about these, these panoramic systems? Well, there's uh, actually more than just um, the panning base with building click stops. Um, we have a focusing rack uh, in the middle, which you can't just use for panorama photography, but also for macro and stereo photography. Yeah. And we also have this uh, blue anodized L bracket, uh, which um, will enable you to um, very quickly uh, turn your camera from portrait to landscape orientation. And the VR System 3 comes with um, uh, stitching software. Uh, what's that? And that is called? Um, this software is called Panorama Studio uh, and it's actually made by um, a German software designer. Okay, and that's both Mac and Windows? Yes, yes. Right. yes it is. Yes. I did find myself doing this a lot uh, mm -hmm. when I was flipping from left to right. Yeah. It does make it very easy. And the other beauty is once you have it lined up, flipping it left to right or up and down doesn't change your nodal point. Yep. Everything's still lined up and it allowed me to get the appropriate video, our appropriate stitches. We're going to finish off our panoramic shots because we got the shots, but how did we create those panoramas? Now you mentioned your Panorama software, Studio. Panoramic, Panorama Studio. What I used was two different softwares. I used Lightroom, mm -hmm. which now has panoramic stitching in it, and I did Photoshop. Now Lightroom does do a great job but you're limited. It does these things called projections, projections yes. where it projects it kind of on a curved surface. It, it assumes that you're looking around, around like that, which is not always the case, especially when you have a rig that's got your nodal point. In this case, everything lines up perfectly already, so you're actually reintroducing some distortion that wasn't there. So Photoshop still offers the option to do something called reposition, which eliminates any of that curvature that happens. So you make your initial capture using the panoramic rig around the nodal point, and then the software will do the rest. So let's take a look. We're going to go into Lightroom first, and then we'll see the advantage that Photoshop offers for this kind of stitching. So there's a lot to explore when you're stitching panoramics, but let's take a look in Lightroom. And Lightroom CC has added panoramic stitching, which does make things a lot easier. So here I have my whole series of images from uh, one of our Teton landscapes uh, going from the far right to the far left and you can see it was quite a few stitches to go across by the way a handy thing out in the field uh, i'll stick my hand in front of the lens to let me know that it's the beginning or end of a panoramic stitch so i've got one let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven pieces to stitch so let's go ahead and select all eleven of those and then we'll go up to photo Photo Merge Panorama. You see these different panoramic projections here, spherical, cylindrical, and perspective. Uh, in general, if you're going to be stitching a vertical uh, shot, like we have here, a series of verticals, you're probably going to want to stick to spherical. Uh, the downside of cylindrical, if you're doing vertical pano stitches like this, is it has a tendency to stretch the image vertically, which is not something you're going to want. Uh, spherical is going to work best for verticals. If you're doing a horizontal, you might find cylindrical works best. Perspective, I have found it rare uh, to be the correct uh, projection, because what it does is it assumes that the things in the middle of the image are further away from you than the ones on either side. So what it does is it ends up creating a distortion where the middle of the image is very far away and on either side it gets closer, and that's rarely the case. It also costs you a lot of cropping. Uh, so in general, perspective is rare that I find it works. Uh, spherical works great for me for vertical stitching, cylindrical for horizontal stitching. 
Okay, so here's our spherical projection. Now you do see this fall off in the corners and that is the nature of the projection. It's actually projecting the image onto a sphere. If you absolutely want to maintain every little edge, then you have to export this into Photoshop and you can do a stitch called a reposition. And we'll take a look at this image in a minute to see how it looks repositioned instead of being done in Lightroom. However, that said, notice how everything lines up, how we have a perfectly straight line across the top and the bottom. And this happened because we were on this panel rig. By having the panel rig level and then having those rotations from right to left, we got a perfectly level stitch and the best quality possible. Now there is an auto crop button here, which will get rid of the areas that were projected into those corners. And there's our image. So I'll go ahead and merge that. And one of the beauties of when you're doing this in Lightroom is it is still a raw file. You can then go ahead and do all of your standard Lightroom edits to this, and then they will be rendered when the file is exported. But just uh, as an example, let's go ahead and take these 11 images, and we're going to send the export into Photoshop, where we can do a panoramic stitch using reposition instead of one of these projections. So here's our final panel stitch as we see it in Lightroom. Again, let's take all 11 of these and send them into Photoshop. So to do that, you go to Photo, Edit In, and then Merge to Panorama in Photoshop. So here we see our 11 images, and you see you have some more projections here. And I'm going to go to reposition again. Reposition is something you can pull off when you did shoot on a panel rig because it's really going to make everything stitch together cleanly. So let's hit OK. And Photoshop will open up each of the 11 images, find an appropriate place to blend the edges together, and give us a stitch without any projection distortions. All right, so here's the Photoshop stitch. And notice when we used reposition, you can see that with the exception of just a couple of pixels, just from my own not being perfectly horizontal, that we didn't lose a single thing. All of the images, all of the pieces stitched together beautifully. Oh, by the way, when you see these little crack lines here, uh, that's just an artifact of the blending. So if we go ahead and just flatten this, that will all go away. So let's let that do its thing. So we go back into Lightroom, and here is the Photoshop stitch. You can see we've lost nothing compared to stitching in Lightroom. And which one you like better is going to be somewhat your choice. Lightroom does a nice job. Photoshop does a perfect job. And again, having this panoramic rig eliminates having to do any of these projections that cause that distortion or loss in height or width. By going into Photoshop and having the panoramic rig do the stitching, you can just use that position, reposition uh, mode of doing stitching, and you get everything from every one of your frames. Very cool stuff. All right, we're back, and we're going to move on to the macro part. Anything else you wanted to... Oh, we had a good question. Somebody asked, "Is it can you mount all of this gear onto other tripod heads? You know, really light stuff, Benro, Enduro, etc." Yes, of course you can do it. Um, all our panorama panning plates come with a quarter-inch thread uh, underneath, and it also has a bushing which uh, translates uh, to the three-eighths. Okay, inch so size. the bottom line is, underneath here is all standard. You can mount yep. this on anything you've got, and the the panoramic plates are all Arca Swiss compatible. So if you have an Arca Swiss type mount, you don't have to buy anything extra for that. Uh, I mentioned the Magic Ball. Here it is again. I've got it on underneath the, uh, the macro rig. He can't uh, keep his hands off. I can't keep my hands <laughs> off of this thing. It really it is an object of desire. It's a sculpture. Uh, so now that we've taken a look at the beauty of panoramic landscapes, now let's get a taste of small landscapes. We're gonna look at the details using macro photography. And I understand both of you have kind of played with that a little bit yourselves. Yes. Yes, we do. All right. Now, while there are options for macro photography, including like, extension tubes yes. and just a macro lens, and even the ability on some systems to reverse the lens front to back, we're going to use a really cool system that gives us a lot more mm -hmm. capability by using a uh, bellows. This is the Novaflex Castball TS90 that I have attached to my Sony a7R II. Gentlemen, what can you tell me about this? 
Well, this is um, actually um, a variable system which uh, will enable customers to use different types of cameras, um, starting with mirrorless cameras, DSLR cameras, medium format cameras. We have uh, so just a, ring, a whole just range an of batteries. Ring that an adapter ring, yes. yes. You just replace it. And on the lens side, we can use um, 35 millimeter lenses, but it has to be um, a manual one with okay. a manual so we aperture go back control to ring. Pull out your old lenses. Exactly. You need, a, you need a manual aperture. You can use enlargement lenses. Which is kind of what this is. This is a Schneider Kreuznach 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter lens. Yeah. Digital. And um, the whole thing itself is just a bellows attachment. Uh, it kind of attaches to the rail underneath so you can take it off and uh, use the rail as a standard focusing rack. Okay, so just like we saw with the panoramic system. It's, exactly. it's can, a completely modular system. So everything's modular, kind of a la carte. You can mix and match pieces and kind of build a kit that's going to do what you need to do. We have tilt and shift in the front. It's about 25 degrees, but most 25 you, degrees. So need about Yes, yeah, so you're, if you're not familiar with a bellows system or you've never done 4x5 photography, this changes the focal plane. Exactly. So that you can have something kind of angled off at a distance and yet maintain focus by doing this. Yeah. So uh, we, we can also shift um, the lens panel. Okay, so, so again, you can change vertical distortions all, all exactly right. yes exactly. so if you've never used a bellow system it does give you a lot of flexibility now again I had a lot of fun maybe too much fun using <laughs> this uh, I shot some stuff I found around the yard as well as some interesting product close-ups in my studio some of you guys know I have this uh, fun relationship with a candy shop in my town <laughs> and they gave me a whole bunch of truffles to play with uh, that we photographed so let's head over to my studio and take a look and see this in action. And we're going to photograph some candy. <laughs> see, we'll talk about it when we get back. So now we're back in my studio. And now we're going to go from the panoramic to the macro. And for the macro, I've got this amazing system sitting on top of my tripod here. And it's the uh, bellows system from NovaFlex. Now there's various different ones. There are basic bellows where you just put your lens in the front. This one's a specialty system it's got a 90 millimeter lens in the front that would allow me to get down to f32 should i want and on the back i just have an adapter ring right here to mount my sony a7r2 onto this system now there's lots of ways you can do macro you can use extension tubes you can use just a straight macro lens there's even some systems where you can actually flip the lens backwards and mount it on your camera which will allow you to focus closer however nothing matches the precision and the versatility of having a bellows system. Now I'm sure you've seen this in the old-fashioned cameras where the, the bellows was used to actually do the focusing and that's kind of what's happening here. But the difference is when you're doing macro work you need a lot of precision particularly if you want to have focus from near to far and I'm going to show you a really cool software that allows us to do that. Let me spin this around so you can see it a little better so you can see I've got the, the lens in front and I've got this on the, the same tripod head that I was using for my panoramics, the Magic Ball. I love it. So you can see my camera mounted here, and in the front, I've got a little adjustment knob that will change the extension of this bellows. This will allow me to get in closer and change my focus point. Now, when you're dealing with macro, when you're getting very close, you have a very, very, very narrow depth of field, and you're going to see that through here. But the advantage of some of the new focusing systems is, in particular, one I'm going to use called Helicon Focus, allows you to take multiple shots just each time moving a little bit of my focus point and then combine them in to one single image that's got focus from beginning to end. It's really amazing. So a couple of the things that go on with this system that you may or may not be familiar with. Let's say, for example, I'm just taking a picture of something simple like a pen or maybe it's jewelry or something like that. Now, if the pen is parallel to the lens, it's easy to get everything in focus. But where it gets troublesome is when you angle if you angle away. Now keep in mind again, you've only got maybe this much focus when we're filling this pen in the frame. So there's two ways to do that. You can either do the focus stacking where you actually take multiple images and focus each time moving back from the front to the back of the pen. Another option you have with a bellow system like this is the ability to change the front element that the lens is sitting in. So if I loosen this here, you can see I can actually turn the lens left and right. I can rotate it. And if I have the camera mounted the other way, this can actually go up and down as well. 
Now what this does is it changes the plane of focus. With this front plate, as you would have with a normal macro lens or an extension tube, everything that's parallel to the lens will be in focus. As soon as it's off closer or further away, it'll go out of focus. By actually rotating the front element so that it is now changing its angle, if I change the angle of the lens plane, what happens is the focal plane changes. So you can actually have something at an angle that you're photographing and by changing the front plate with the lens in it to start to match that angle, it changes the depth of field. It actually changes the focus plane to mirror what is going on here. Really cool if you've never done medium format or any kind of camera with a bellows system, like a four x five, this might be foreign to you. Uh, if you've done that, then this is very normal. So one other addition to this whole system that makes it really work is actually something peculiar to the Sony camera. The Sony has an interesting option called focus peaking. And what it does is as you see something in focus in the frame, since we're manually focusing, it will actually outline the focused areas in a color you get to choose. It can be red, green, yellow, or white. So when you do that, what, it allow, what this system allows you to see, the combination of the focus peaking on the camera and the small adjustments of the front knob to move the bellows in and out, you can actually see what's in focus changing as you zoom in, as you move the front element. Very cool. So what you can do is you just wait to see, okay, here's the front piece in focus and just take little movements back so that you see that little focus line move. Kind of hard to understand, but actually we'll watch it in the camera. So I'm going to get everything set up. I do have the pen, which is fairly uninteresting to photograph, but it does serve a good purpose because it's a long piece that we can show at an angle and you can apply this to jewelry or clothing or what have you to have a little more fun. I stopped at our friend's place, the candy apple shop here in Warwick, and I got a box of truffles. So I've got little truffles set in a line and I've got a piece of black plexiglass behind me, which is really cool for products and jewelry. And we're going to set up a little line of truffles, show you how you can change the focus point as you move back and capture each of those images. And then we'll use the focus stacking software to put them together. We'll also do another one with the front bellows, uh, front bellows uh, lens attachment being rotated. So we can see if we can get close to focus from near to far. The focus stacking software will allow you to take a whole bunch of images with different focus points along the piece and it will put it all together beautifully. So let's take a look first. Uh, after I get the camera set up, I'm going to show you the back of the camera closely so you can see how focus peaking works and how, work, how well it works when you're using a bellows system like this for macro photography. Camera is on. All right, so here we see the back of the camera and I've got this little focus peaking going on. Do you see the little yellow stuff that's kind of vibrating? What focus peaking does is it will wrap around any kind of high contrast edge. And by the way, the better lit the system, the better you'll see it. But watch what happens as I change the focus position of the front element. So there you can see the glowing yellow around the front truffle. And as I start to move back, now you're starting to see a little bit on the white one and then the dark one. And as I go back further, now you can see the edge of the white truffle, the second one, and then the third one in, the real dark chocolate one, is now glowing in yellow. And then as I continue to move back, then the back truffle gets the focus. So the trick is, and I'll start with the back since we went there first, I'm just going to get the back edge of the truffle lit up. I'm going to take a picture. I've got my timer on, so it will take that first picture. And only the back truffle is now in focus. So I'm going to back off a little bit. I'm going to start to come closer to the foreground. And now we can see some of the, the third truffle out starting to get in focus. All right. Again, the first two are still out of focus. I'm going to come in a little bit more. We'll do about eight shots or so. Okay. Now the second, the third truffle is in sharp focus. I'm going to come in a little further until the second one starts to show up. Better. We come in a little bit more. Now we're starting to see a little bit of the front truffle start to light up. Again, that's the camera telling us that it's now starting to get into focus. 
come in a little bit more. And the precision of this bellows is what makes this possible because everything stays lined up. Now, one thing, yes, you are changing the distance of the front element to the product. And that is gonna cause a slight change in size. However, the software is able to deal with that to make sure that when it puts it together, everything is sized perfectly. Let's come in a little bit more right to the front edge of the front truffle. All right, now we've got our series of shots where this first one has just the front truffle effect. If I hit the play button, the front truffle is in focus. And as I start to go back, you can see it's starting to shrink. But as it does that, the focus point moves back to the last truffle. So we're going to take these images into the computer and we're going to let the software do its magic. Now, while we're here, let's do one other option. One other option I mentioned about moving the front plate. I'm going to have the front plate mirror the angle of the products. Now, as I do that, it moves. So let's go ahead and reframe. So I'll loosen my tripod head here. Got to be careful you don't do it too far. You start to cause a lot of vignetting as you're starting to see on that last one. All right, so now I have the front plate where the lens is attached angled so that it mirrors the angle of the truffles out there. So let's, and you can see already that we've gotten more focus. You can see by doing that, that both the front truffle is in focus as well as the third one in. And we can also adjust to see. Now the focus moves a little bit. We wanna see if we can get a place where we've got all of them in pretty good focus, which seems to be about right there. So let's try this. So here's a single shot, and we'll compare this to our focus stacking to see how close you're able to get by using this front element. So uh, tell me that that candy shot didn't look cool. Now, a couple of you were talking about fo focus stacking software. Uh, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. We'll actually show how that, how that works. Uh, yes, Photoshop can do it. I did find the Helicon Focus, though, really, really did, That's a, good one. It did a better job it was very fast and it gives you a couple different options so any other things you want to add about the uh, the macro system michael Lee. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, really straightforward really the, the, it really is the, the point you have to we have to notice is what you can um, what you can reach with the bella system so if you oh, take, that's a good point if we were you, talking if you about can, lenses. yes if you use shorter focal lengths um, you can reach up to a seven time magnification over the bella system itself so um, so it's kind of counterintuitive exactly, you would think yes. you'd need a longer lens for greater magnification Definitely it's the not. opposite it's the opposite so yes. with a 90 millimeter we're at about one to one exactly yes. at a 24 millimeter it was the 24 uh, Going up to about seven times. Seven to one magnification. Seven to one, yeah. 20, so 28. 28. 28. So if you're into, uh, if you're into insects. Yeah, you have, you're definitely. If you're into bugs, go 28. Yeah. So it's, that's certainly one of the options. Uh, I, did, I did have a lot of fun with this. And as you could see, by doing those multiple shots over the course of the changing the focus point, it stacked together well. Now you, you probably would like to see how that actually happens. So let's go back into software and see how we can stack together images with different focus points into a close-up shot that's going to have tack sharp focus from front to back. And again, we did try it with the bellows, with the shift. By doing this, that will change the, the focus oh, plane. Yeah, the focus. However, when you've got an extreme plane, if you go too far, you're going to start to vignette. Yeah, you're it's limited. exactly the same. So by do, doing the focus stack, you can have focus from, from near to far. So let's see how the focus stacking is done. You're going to be amazed how easy it is. Well, I'm going to wrap up and then we'll come back and take the last of your questions. So I brought our images in uh, of our focus stack and you can see them here. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. So here's our front truffle in focus. And if I go to the first in this series, we'll see the far truffle in focus. And you can see how there's much of a size change, but still no worries. So I'm going to take these eight images and I'm going to export them. I'm just going to export them as JPEGs to make this process a little faster. We'll make them 1920 since that's the resolution of the video. And I'll export these eight files and then we'll bring them into Helicon Focus. While that's doing it, 
Let's take a look at the last image here. And this is the one where I adjusted the focal plane of the front element on the bellows system. It does a pretty good job. It's not quite as sharp focus as we're going to see with the focus stacking. As soon as this is done exporting here, yeah, we can kind of zoom in a bit. We'll look at the front. Not too bad. We can see we've got the front of the truffle in pretty good focus. We've got a little defocusing out here. That's not necessarily a problem. And as we go to the back, holds focus pretty well. It's really not terrible. And again, since we had the focus plane mirroring this angle of the truffles, it did a pretty good job. And actually where it started to fall off, which towards the back. So that's not terrible, but let's take a look and see what the focus stacking software can do. So let's switch over to Helicon Focus. And I'm just going to open up the images that we just exported. And here's the focus stack two. So here's our eight images. I'm gonna open these and it brings them right into the software. And you can see again from the first one, we've got focus, nothing in the front. I'm going to use the method A, the basic method, and let's just click on render and see what happens. So we go ahead and it automatically scans through all of them, and holy cow, look at that image. You can see already everything's in close focus here. In fact, let's zoom in a bit. So you can see now this image on the right compared to the one on the left, you can see they're all in focus. Let me go ahead and save this, and we'll bring it back into Lightroom. And I'll call it uh, Focus Stack 2. And save that. I'm going to do it at a high resolution. And we'll take a look at this back in Lightroom so we can see better. Now there's a lot more options to this software. And I invite you to explore more. Uh, you can read about what they do. You can see continuous surfaces. If we go to Method C. If you're doing a very deep stack. And Method A is very smooth and preserves colors. I, I like this one for doing things like food. So let's jump back into Lightroom and we're gonna go ahead and import that image. All right, so here's our focus stack brought in. Let's go ahead and zoom in. And you can see as we scan from the front truffle all the way to the back, everything's just tack sharp. It's really quite a remarkable system. And there's our image ready for the video. Very cool stuff. As, well, as long as we're here, let me just show you another example. Uh, this was of a, of a deep lollipop, and you can see that it again is in focus from one edge to the other. And when you compare it to the actual individual images, you can see, actually let's just look at the first and last so you can see that. There's the front in focus, there's the back in focus, and we were able to stack it to here. All right, and here, as I mentioned, just a couple little found objects around the yard, some leaves, and again, this kind of decorative thing can make for really interesting prints. And here's one of our invites, just a leaf with a little bit of water in it. And then getting up close just to one little flower sitting on a, a railing with some peeling paint, just so you can see. See a little closer. One, two, three. And this stuff makes great decorative artwork that people will buy. And there it is. Good enough to eat. And again, the great, the great thing about this part is I get to eat them now. I hope you get a sense of how much fun this has been. Now, to me, this is both fun and a little bit dangerous because I get started using these things. And these things are a lot of fun. There's so many things you can go out and photograph you never thought of. This firm's a very decorative kind of photography, by the way. If you're looking to sell photography, you can find, find random things. I shot some leaves, as I, as I showed you. Uh, I shot some flowers. I shot my pen. I shot the truffles. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. In fact, uh, expect to see these on the Candy Apple Shop website before too long because the photography that we got out of this is nothing short of spectacular. You can also get abstract. Find little find, found items, little shapes, what have you. And if you think color and tone and shape, you can create a lot of interesting decorative photography that people would love to put in their homes. I like to think in terms of three or four, think of a triptych, uh, where I'll actually have three different similarly colored images that kind of have some kind of relationship to each other. 
this opens a whole new world. This is an incredibly well-made system. It's very, actually very easy to use. It's very obvious. And having the advantage of a mirrorless camera with that focus peaking really lets you see exactly what's in focus in the frame. And you'll have a better understanding both of if you need to tilt the front element to get your focus plane changed, or if you're gonna to need to do a focus stack because it's just too much for it. But this combination is spectacular. I'm looking forward to using it. I'm probably gonna do some more food photography with it and whatever I can find. I know insects are fun, plants, what have you, found items. Stay tuned, there's a lot more to come. So let's get back to the studio. Now, I had done focus stacking before using Photoshop, but I did find that the Helicon Focus really just made it so fast and so much easier. I mean, you saw it, guy. You saw it in operation there. You know, the whole thing about macro photography is it does make you look at the world a little differently. You start looking for the details rather than obviously than the grand landscapes, and it does provide sort of an unlimited source of photographic subjects. And that also look very different when you see them up close. They can get very abstract. In fact, uh, Kim, I don't know if it was you who said it about actually photographing maybe a broken light bulb. Right. Uh, you know, with the filament in there that when you get close enough, you're really not even going to know what it is because the context is taken away yeah. and it does become a design element instead. And this does have commercial appeal. If you guys want to create stuff that you can sell, it does become more of a shape design graphic sure. that's going to have color and shape that does work really well and I find it works really well when you do it in threes. Mm -hmm. Do a little triptych, groups of things that are somehow related either through color or shape or design. Now, I know there's a lot more we could have talked about, but obviously I have limited time. So how about if we come back another day and we'll talk about some more techniques, some more definitely. gear, definitely. more applications. We'll definitely do this. All right. So any other comments you guys wanted to make before we head out? Well, I think we, we covered most of it. Um, Thanks uh, for having us. Thank um, you. It, was, Thank it you was a lot of fun doing this webinar with you, Joe. Cool. And um, we hope to do some new webinars in the future. I hope you. so too. Would be uh, great. And as you can imagine, there's a lot more to NovaFlex that we'll plan on exploring in the near future. In the meantime, again, you can visit NovaFlex.com. Let's uh, just take a look at that address one more time in case I'm not enunciating it correctly or well enough. And also, <laughs> if you happen to end up in it in German, just make sure you click on the word English and uh, you'll see the site in, in English. <laughs> so, gentlemen and lady, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to use some of this great equipment. So that's it for today. Again, thank you guys all for watching. Thanks thank for your you. great questions. Hope to see you online again soon. But until next time, be well and keep shooting. Bye. 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 Ciao.